everybody, this is Feng Zhu speaking and welcome to Design Cinema episode 69 called Production Pitch. So what we're going to show in this episode is the process which is well, what concept guys use to get a project started. Usually in the production pipeline, the scripts come very, very early and most of the production team have no idea if this project even goes live or not. So what we're going to do for this episode is show you guys kind of the loose process of how concept guys are role is in this pro in this pipeline and i'm going to be working with another concept artist named eduardo pena who is here with me and we're going to go through the entire process of from looking at research getting an initial idea discussing what kind of concept we should do to all the way to producing the art which you guys is uh, it's a big part of design cinema we'll go through that as well and we'll talk about how we actually pitch these concepts to the producer types so we're going to start off with research and development, which usually entails about an hour or two of discussion between the concept guys, and usually sometimes the producers involved, sometimes not. In this case, we're going to take an IP called Dune, which hopefully most of you guys are familiar with, and we're going to pretend that we're going to try to pitch Dune as a next-gen concept for a game. So this is very typical uh, of things that happen in the video game industry, so in which an IP is bought by somebody and say a company like Activision or EA or something like that comes along and buys these IPs and now they want to develop it, they want to turn it into a game. But before they spend any money on these kind of things, they want to prove a concept. And this is where concept guys come in because for us to do this, it's a very fast turnaround. Usually it takes about a week or so to do so. And so yeah, back to the point, we're going to start by looking at references. What do we do with this IP? So Edward and I are going to be looking through concept art, we're going to be looking at other comp competition IPs, we're going to look at other forms of uh, references that evolve this kind of look, which is Doom. And then we're gonna go sit down and generate our own way of concept. And in most studios, the concept guys, sometimes they don't even talk to each other during this process. That is done on purpose to ensure that one concept guy's idea, another one stays completely fresh versus a, there's five of us on board and we're all gonna try to do the same thing. Essentially, that's five artists doing the five same images. It doesn't really give us a variation. So in this way, it worked great, and we actually did that on this project in which Eduardo and I completely separate without looking at each other's work for the entire week, and then we came together on the end of the week to present it to a producer. So, and that's the process I'll show you. Uh, later, we'll cut to the actual painting and drawing thing, and that's where Ed and I will be uh, discussing the various techniques we used, the artsy stuff we did, and the kind of concept we chose to uh, do the paintings with. And then, of course, we'll wrap it with the uh, pitching to the production. So, but let me introduce you to Eduardo, who is uh, now at FZD as a full-time instructor. So he'll go over his background and what he brings to this project. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Eduardo Peña. Uh, I'm from Colombia in South America. I've been working as a concept artist for the last six years of my life. Uh, I've been working on different projects in um, film, and video games. Uh, I, I came from Weta Digital and Weta Workshop doing cinematic concept art and concept development for different sort of projects. Um, and as Feng told you, uh, I've been involved in different projects like pitches and project development. And I, uh, sometimes I have to design different sort of things uh, like cinematic design or concept art or uh, concept design as well. But in this case, I want to have the more the cinematic approach to that because that's my background and that's the way how I been developing this for for this uh, period of time. So it's very fun at, at the beginning because you have like this freedom to explore, to find different ways of solving this particular problem. And after that, you keep developing this and at a time that you're literally building this world and make it look believable for the audience, for the targets. And after that, you can create a product that you can be uh, exposed uh, in the market. So production paintings or designs are generally done and a time period given to most concept guys is about a week because we do want to keep this process fast. The whole point of this is to get a project up into visuals. So from a script, it's very hard to sell the idea because you can show that to 50 guys on a team and they still have no idea exactly what the vision of this project might look like. So what we do is usually on a Monday, we get these scripts or rough ideas and we take about a week to generate anywhere from six to 12, maybe sometimes up to 30, 40, depending on how many concept guys you have on a team. Um, to generate a massive amount of concept bar, we put that on the wall on a Friday and this is when the quote unquote money people come in to take a look at this project and if the visuals are strong enough, this, usually this is when the project goes green and that's when this project is now funded, is, it has a big studio behind it and for games and films it works exactly the same way so yeah, so that's what that process is about
Hola and hi there guys, this is Eduardo Peña here. Uh, today I'm going to have the privilege of sharing these uh, techniques and workflow that I used to, to develop all the time when I have this sort of work uh, and have the, the chance and the opportunity to share with you guys this through the FCD channel which is a great honor and privilege. So, uh, okay, uh, basically, when I receive this sort of uh, jobs and work to do, I start finding references of, of, of what's the, the project about, uh, what sort of references I need to compile, what, what sort of uh, environment, what sort of great, uh, things happen in this world. Um, I'm a, a big fan of the genre, I'm a big fan of the the book, a uh, big fan of, of everything that is uh, involved or interacting in this world. So basically, when I start doing this, I start doing a research. I start finding my own gallery, my own textures, uh, finding the, the possible references that attach directly with this universe, with this world, and then trying to find something that belongs to that world in terms of the the, the, the nature of, of, of this universe, like textures, uh, uh, the, the story itself. So all those elements can help me and allow me to understand what I'm going to design. So when I'm, when I'm building the mood boards, I think it's a very important thing in the process because you have to, to organize all these ideas and put it together in order to in order to achieve uh, a concept development stage. So I divide it in three elements. I, I divide it in, in, in three phases, which is like textures, uh, sensations, um, movies. In this case, I put like uh, David Lynch movies uh, and Lawrence of Arabia because of the cinematography and Book of Eli because of the mood design. So I have this uh, in terms of references for movies because I need that to understand what's going on. Uh, and then I started doing a compilation of textures and references to to find the sensations. You know, like all these movies reminds me certain certain uh, textures, certain elements like earth. In this case, I, I play with the metaphor of four elements. In this case, I play with earth and wind. So I try to find uh, references, photos, and textures in relation to that. And then I, I try to find. Uh, in this case, because I'm when I design focus more on the sound worms or the Shai Hulud, maybe my pronunciation is not right. Sorry for the fans out there. Uh, the, the sound worms, they call it Shai Hulud. Uh, so finding like references that, that, that are really, you know, like similar to these sort of creatures. Okay, so on the concept development, after doing the compilation, after getting involved with the, the whole inspirational references, uh, I start like doing, okay, let's start building the world. And my idea for that, as, as Feng probably will tell you in, in, his, in his intervention, is, is more about like, okay, I want to I wanna take a more like an open world video game. And maybe because in these days, the gap between video games and film is like, it's, it's, so, it's so close now. So now you see video games similar to a film and you see like films similar to video games. So you, you don't see any difference now. So I think like all games these days are more cinematic and have different approaches, have different uh, ways of development, ways of expose uh, the world to the, to the gamers as well. So what I'm trying to do, uh, the previous experience that I have working on this is like getting, getting the result as, as, as cinematic as I can. So the first image that I tried to develop, that the one that I'm looking now here, is uh, defining this first uh, moment of a main character interacting with this Chai Hulu. Uh, we have like this universe that, in some stage, can be ruled by magic and uh, and elements. So I, I like to use a lot of metaphors or uh, words that reminds me something in order to to build what, what I need to build. So when I'm saying elements, I say, okay, earth and wind. So I know that earth belongs to certain, uh, certain elements like rocks and sand and mountains, all these things that are solid and wind, it could be like obviously these storms, the sky. 
So all these elements are very important to, to, to be there involved in certain states in order to develop well the whole piece. So what I'm trying to do here is like, obviously I need to create like an epic scenario, like very cinematic one, when this main character is interacting with these uh, big sandworms and it needs to like, to have like some sort of, uh, like the interaction needs to be aggressive, obviously, because you're, you're, you're playing with this and have like these uh, massive structures moving around. And at the same time you're playing, obviously a big cinematic moment appears so that's that's very important when you play God of War or even Shadow of the Colossus. You see that thing like you see massive structures, massive characters, creatures move in the background, but it's not just for decoration or just putting there for no purpose. It's like it's interaction purpose. So I think like once you approach to these things, you see the sand moving around that, and after after that you see these big sound worms appearing from the ground underneath, and and, and you and you have to position yourself in a very specific spot to increase uh, some power and maybe summon these creatures or possess these creatures use some, a certain amount of energy and then like uh, with that sort of magic and energy or elemental energy you can summon or, or possess these creatures and, and you know like domain in some stage just to make it look like okay this game is very interesting you have to walk there in the, in the, in the desert you're entirely alone but in any moment you can perceive like okay you, you, you need a creature or, or you, you need like you need to, to absorb the this part of the energy main energy of, of this of this creature so like uh, basically the, the first two images I'm focusing more on that cinematic approach I'm trying to mind like okay well, what about it like the main character is doing this and it's getting the creature taking the creature down and how that looks like you know like you see the, the in-game purpose of that you see the, the main character just running around um, like getting these obstacles maybe a sandstorm is, is affecting him is interacting with him meanwhile the cinematics are interacting with the game thing as well so you, you sometimes you don't perceive the difference between if you're playing a video game or you're you're like watching a movie but you're playing the movie so it's, 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 it's like it's quite interesting and challenging as well it's, it's, it's quite interesting it's very fun actually you know like 20 years ago technology was totally different but now it's like as I told you before the gap between uh, the designing a video game or a movie is actually the same and when I was working and doing films or video games I was like having the same, the same purpose, the same approach. So it's it's quite fun, it's quite uh, challenging as well, but doable. Obviously, we can we can definitely explore different ways of solving these problems using the same the same design principles. So in this case, I want to be like use like uh, imagine that I have a big wide lens here and I try to just increase the sense of depth and the scale of these creatures. Just to make it look like super epic and strange, you know, like this thing is falling down. And my focus here is in terms of uh, creating like nice um, VFX things because at the end of the day, you, you provide this to a VFX supervisor or VFX uh, artist, it's gonna translate your concept in real time thing. So you have to provide as much information you can, but in this case, I'm designing the mood, I'm designing the, the cinematography and the the specific moment that this thing is maybe is falling down how it looks like uh, what sort of effects and what sort of things will will do on that so I, i'm focusing uh, in lighting i'm focusing in the direction composition all these principles that obviously you must know uh, as a concept artist as a designer and obviously as a cinematographer you have to achieve a lot of things in one piece so which is like really really interesting and um, in all of these three pieces that I'm going to show you, uh, I start very, very loose and monochromatic because I want to keep it like that, monochromatic, low values. Uh, because, uh, okay, I, the exploration that I, I'm doing to this world needs to be, or needs to have this sort of uh, mute colors, the different sort of accents, and you have like different, uh, you have like this uh, interaction with the characters, like very very uh, monochromatic, uh, mute, and it's like lonely character. So the colors needs to have this sort of narration. And the way how I solve this, I start like composition 
finding axis, finding direction, uh, weights, balance, dynamic shapes, and I start very basic, black and white, and then I do a, like a rough color. In this case, like just yellowish, ochre, red color, like sand colors, warm colors. But the, the trick here is that I try to use warm colors, which which means that they're optimistic, you know, like yellow, red, they're really optimistic colors. But how I turn those optimistic colors is something like it's dark and it's like lonely, and you have like this sort of um, sadness, but not direct sadness. It's, it's something that try to evoke that sort of feeling. Yeah, use warm colors and try to desaturate those colors, how that works. So that's the way how I approach this thing in a chromatic point of view. And as I told you before, like, I try to design big shapes to then block them, block them out uh, with brushwork textures and photo textures and all this stuff just to merge them together and make the, a good integration between all the elements involved that, to present a nice uh, concept piece. So, uh, after that, I, I always I focus on the particles, um, things that are displaying and interacting uh, around the whole piece. Because I, I, I believe in the holistic point of view, everything needs to be related to like the volumes, the shapes, the particles, the light, the elements, the ground, everything needs to be related in order to provide narration or narrative. The like information is something that you perceive instantly something that your mind can catch in less than a second so i need to capture the movement i need to capture uh, the sensation the what's going on like that a specific moment that's the two seconds of that little piece of movie that just appeared there i need to i need just to contain it and make it look okay that's that's a moment of the movie that, lo that looks cool and meanwhile you're playing meanwhile you're doing this action with the creature or whatever and you see all the cinematics so that's the priority for me. I want to approach this more, not that, not more in the gameplay or the design of the world. I'm more, I want to, I, I, I want to solve this problem is more in a cinematic point of view that can be applied in in a video game. Like how it looks like after you take this creature down, how it looks like th that moment with this guy, with the main character is doing this. Probably, probably part of the free man or like uh, mercenary, it's like the the. The game could be could evolve that the game design, but now I need to provide this because I know that the new games of these times have this approach. So the first two is gonna be like that. But the third one is gonna be an environment design, just show a, a, an overall setting. And the techniques are basically the same. I start like using black shapes, black silhouettes, and um, different uh, weights, axes to create directions uh, to create like tension. All these principles of design that obviously pr basic principles that obviously we get introduced since the beginning of our careers um, I, I try to apply that all the time because my background is more as a graphic designer so so it's something that I learned as a principle and it's, it's easily adaptable to the concept art because we're talking about all the time about composition about rhythm uh, about weights uh, about how these things can convert, how these things can evoke and communicate a single concept. So it's how we build that in different ways. So uh, in this case, I'd like to just introduce a uh, different color. You know, what about we create a nice contrast? You know, like we have these this, uh, warm colors in a cold setting, and then we interact with a very uh, a, a nice ac accent, you know, like a violet accent they're interacting like the power or the magic or these things. So what I do all the time is like I keep separate uh, all my thumbnails. I, I just frame it a little bit to make it look like a frame of a, of a film. I just see, I just see the, the other concept that I'm working on. Like I just put in a little bit of that light in there. And I, I just keep framing it like that because I like to see the, I, I like to see, yeah, exactly the frame like that. So it's like cinematic. So now I have the two and that is like evocative thing for me so I keep it very loose uh, and basically uh, I, I, I try to keep it like very simple in this case I'm, I'm using a uh, rock 3d model that I did uh, very experimental software uh, I think it's a mandible yeah I just do random shapes that to help me to understand volume shape and then I obviously give it like a purpose and a reason 
and I keep it very simple. I don't use uh, too many brushes here. I just leave a soft brush and a hard brush. That's what I need. The, the, the simple, the better, less is more. I start doing that, blocking out uh, shapes, volumes, and finding uh, light spots. Uh, that's the way that how you can compose very well all these all these things together. Uh, using the same uh, the same color, the same structures, uh, reusing the same line work. So it's, it's really good because part of the, the the thing that I talk with my students a lot is like try to use the resource as much as you can. Understand the potential. Understand the potential of all the resources that you have. If you have le less resources the better because you understand the potential, the entire potential of, uh, of one thing. If you have just one element, you can use it. You have one brush, just use it. So for example here, I'm just using soft brush for everything and uh, a smooch tool. And the soft brush provide me this soft edges thing against the hard edges that I have in my volume, in my volumetric 3D model. So it's always a balance. I will try to establish a balance between uh, sharp and soft so that helps to establish the density of detail and the focal points to be more uh, sharp and you know like understandable in a viewer point of view uh, you can see like okay once i establish the the, the the direction the composition all the stuff i start rendering playing with uh, textures uh, you know like uh, volumes shapes Try to find not that accidental value. I don't want to call it accidental because uh, accidents don't don't solve all these problems. I call it more like this reaction, more that accident. I call it the reaction of the brush, the reaction of the texture. They provide me solutions, simple solutions. And once I have everything blocked, I start like putting. Okay, let's put these textures here. Let's put some highlight here, and let's try to find the focal point. In this case, my focal point will be this structure, like abandoned. Uh, temple abandoned structure part of the culture of this world like unexplored unexplored uh, unexplored uh, architecture unexplored setting something like that so I'm just I, uh, I just in this in this case I just want to be more like a, like a viewer like I want to be like the character okay I, I want to be introduced to this world so uh, okay, in a cinematic point of view so I see this setting first I said whoa what, what's, what's going on there it's like some part of construction build build or, or some terraformers try to build something there that is abandoned or being under construction or being destroyed by something but I try to give that mystery to the audience I, I like to have the formula uh, of not showing too much I like to hide and expose hide and expose something you expose something and you hide something the expectation is much better because if you show everything to the people to the people people will not uh, lose interest in that I don't like that I don't I don't I, I don't want to see that anymore because you already showed me that but if you as an artist as a as a visual communicator you sort like okay I need to expose certain amount of information and I want the viewer to complete that for me that's a really interesting formula and applies really well in films so what about if I do the same thing here in video games? What about if, if the if the user or the gamer is there, like the main character is there, and you see like something, and you have to go to that place. You know, the main character, yeah, the main character is there, like, okay, you have to be there. Maybe the camera is here, and maybe the second camera is gonna have a like, close-up on over his shoulder looking through that epic vista, and you see like the, the red lights and all thing, all these things happening, like what's going on there. So that magic is related to the first concept that is like are possessing or affecting the creatures, the shy hulut or sand worms. So what's going on there? So it's like creating this relationship, creating these attachments, you know. So we're not, we're trying to get here more in the narrative, in the cinematography, expectation. So after that, I did like uh, obviously I'm a, I'm a graphic designer. I like to care about the little details at the end, you know, like. Uh, the metaphors and create like a fake title, the Ancient Sands or something like that. Just to, you know, like, because I want to be a character living this world. I want to be this character living this game in some stage. Maybe this this Ancient Sand is part of the, the video game. And what I do is like choosing a simple phone and start turning that uh, in something like techy and futuristic, uh, stuff like simplicity. Very, very simple. It's nothing fancy at all. And turn the D in, in a dune or something you know, like playing with those metaphors. 
So it's at the end of the day, you, you're living, you're living that world, you're living that stuff. So you have to have fun with that in order to provide uh, a good result in a concept, uh, concept development thing. So hope you guys enjoyed this uh, visual development. Uh, all these techniques are th something that I will, I'm happy to share with you all the time. I'm sharing with this every day with my students. Um, yeah, hopefully you have fun doing this and have like read some books and imagine that you're doing a pitch for some crazy director or video game, whatever you want to do and do five or three, four, five paintings, whatever, you know, design epic vistas, uh, design creatures, design environments, whatever you want to design. Live the world that you want to be, be a character of your world. And that's the way how you can achieve something good. At the end of the day, you will feel like, okay, I, I did something nice. I, I want to keep exploring that. All right, guys, this is Fane speaking, and let's just jump right into the production side of this episode. So first, I'll cover the ideas behind these paintings, why I chose to do them, and the, the kind of the thinking behind them, and later I'll get into the technical aspect of it. So here I am trying to design three images that are reminiscent of classical RPG games that came out in the mid-90s on the PC. For example, games such as Baldur's Gate, the Icewind Dale series, as well as Fallout 1 and 2, Planescape Torment, and uh, yeah, a few other ones as well. For those who play classical PC games, you're probably familiar with these IPs. The most recent version of these games are, uh, I believe, Dragon Age Origins, which is made by the same company that made, um, this is Bioware, who made uh, Baldur's Gate. So this is not a action-based game that I'm trying to design here. For example, Diablo series, which uses similar top-down three-quarter view cameras, but those are typically called hack and slash, they're real-time uh, base games, whereas the Baldur's Gate games are turn-based. So I thought, why did I choose this, right? Why did I choose this kind of gameplay to design? It's because Dune itself is a, is a classic book that I think are more familiar to the generation of my age, you know, the 30, age, 30 years old and plus age group. So therefore, these guys also most likely grew up with games like Baldur's Gate and, and Icewind Dale and are used to this type of gameplay. So if you're going to target an older IP, quote unquote, to a audience, then perhaps these type of gameplay will also uh, affect the audience as well. So, but in the real pitching process, in the real game studio, uh, we're not really in charge of this at all. The type of gameplay, for example, is it an FPS, a third person shooter? These are not really in our hands. We're usually, the game studio has already decided what type of game to make, and we're usually responsible only for the visual part. Um, but since this is a mock-up video, I decided to give myself the uh, the kind of the freedom to design any type of game I want. Since I'm a big fan of these classical hardcore games, I decided to do a three-quarter down view uh, game. Now, there's a lot of um, technical uh, cool things about a top-down three-quarter view game. One of the most important things is that because we don't see horizon, we could actually control the polygon screen uh, on screen much better than an open world game in which you see the horizon. Because in those games, a player could technically align themselves with a lot of geometry and slowing the game down big time in terms of uh, frames per second. So a lot of companies have to kind of have an average poly count for every area so players don't get into a situation where they're stacking, uh, quote unquote, stacking polygons on top of each other and slowing their game down. In a top-down game, you can never have that situation because we control every screen. Um, therefore, you can actually allocate a lot more polygons and textures per screen than you can in an open world game. That allows us to focus more on, for example, atmosphere, physics, a lot of things that you have to kind of push back a bit on open world games. Of course, on next gen, you're going to have a lot more freedom. But if you're going to do a top down three quarter view on next gen, that actually opens up a ton of freedom in terms of what kind of graphics you could do. I think you see some of that in the latest Diablo games, uh, Torchlight and some of these titles. They are, of course, action based games, but same camera angle. And you can see there's a lot more animations uh, in the in the little nu nuances for like, plants, you know, little rocks, birds and all these kind of things. You just have a little bit more um, things to play with in a three quarter view. Of course, you don't have the giant vistas and the epic scale that you could achieve in an open world game. But of course, it's a, it's a take and give thing. So I started these images by uh, using a perspective grid that I've made uh, years ago. And I selected three different grids that are three quarter view already. So therefore it kind of just helps me out a bit. Uh, of course, we could um, design these without the aid of a grid and kind of just put the perspective in ourselves. But it, it is a time saver. It saves about uh, maybe 20 minutes or so uh, in the production pipeline. These videos have been sped up uh, 
by about uh, I'm not exactly sure this is about 20 minutes long I think in real time this took me about about three to four hours to complete each one about an hour long in real time so now the concept behind these is that obviously it's doom but to make an entire RPG game on a desert planet with nothing but sand could be quite boring because what made uh, the Baldur's Gates and Icewind Dales in these games quite interesting is that you get to explore you get to go to one location to another so I decided to do three kind of unique locations based on kind of the abandoned world concept for perhaps this uh, this planet is now been abandoned after they mined all the spices and now you come back to it and maybe looking for somebody or something so you're seeing maybe buildings that are 500 years old that used to be used for mining spices and now are completely abandoned and taken over by the local population so yeah that's the concept behind these but of course i want to make it quite dry so it all seems possible on a desert planet but playing around with different kind of geometry and you can see here after i did a line drawing i'm just laying in the kind of photo elements that's going to help me enhance these uh, paintings so the use of photos is is uh, very widely used in the business and you guys see me do that quite a bit in the other videos as well so it's a time saver it's not going to help you paint any better or help you come up with something a little bit better it, it's a process only and if you know how to use it well it's very very uh, good to use but uh, we actually discourage our students to learn this very early because you get into the problem of photo bashing in which there's no design but just end up with a bunch of random bash photos that kind of suggest something but there's actually nothing there so we definitely encourage our students to start with line drawings kind of what i'm doing here as well um so you have a little bit of control over the final concept so but that's not that depends on who you are if you're very pro you don't need to do this process sometimes you can actually just go in and start painting uh, right away because you have a good idea uh, but generally for students we do advise you to at least draw something have an idea what you're going to go for so here i'm kind of blocking in the the old mining stuff that are being left around now here's a little bit of cheat i'm using a blue as blue based atmosphere so of course on a desert planet or somewhere that's very very dry i don't think the atmosphere is going to be blue because that's going to say that there's actually water in the air but of course i think we have to take some liberties otherwise i think this game could possibly look very boring that the entire game is always this yellow pellet so i did introduce some blue and that's kind of an artistic license and two you could always argue that maybe on this planet there is some other uh, element in the air that could produce a bluish hue um yeah because blue does look very nice with this kind of brown color scheme i think this is the image this image what i'm looking at right now i kept it pretty much brown and a little bit aqua based color so I'll stay away from the blue a bit but still overall I'm trying to keep these look like it's kind of margin uh, based planet okay. so let's go back to the game design um, for three-quarter view games, I love doing these. I mean, on my day jobs, we, we take on mostly these open world. I mean, almost every next-gen game that our studio take on are these open world, big, ginormous, epic scale, uh, you know, like Dragon Age, these type of kind, kind of games. Um, so it's kind of fun for me to kind of step back from that and do something a little bit more zoomed in, a little bit more focused on the tiny bit of an area. And I just loved about the original Baldur's Gate and Planescapes and that they're just awesome because the detail level is so high. Uh, you can actually look at a corner of the screen and get a ton of information that I think sometimes when you go to polys, uh, go to a polygon-based game you know, or low polygon-based game, you lose a little bit of that the effect. I think next gen, you're going to see maybe that changing a bit, but I actually like the kind of classical hand-sculpted, hand-painted textures on all this. Um, but there's some difference I want to do for this one. For example, you look at top-down based games now, like Diablo and Torchlight, um, and even the new one that came out, I think Path to Exile. Um, these games are generally based slightly on the cartoony side of things. So the textures are more cartoony, the colors are a little bit cartoony, even the scale of the characters and creatures are cartoony. So I thought it would be really cool to do a top-down game in which the scale and textures are realistically based, realistic atmosphere. Um, I believe Dragon Age is kind of like that, but even Dragon Age is a little bit more stylized to be uh, in a kind of hyper fantasy realm versus being absolutely realistic. So uh, maybe it will be cool to do a game in which you're really modeling rocks to be real and all the geometry, all the metal are in scale to the characters. Uh, it could look cool, not sure. But these are things that uh, as a concept artist, that's what you try to pitch for a game. Um, we have to really sell these concepts. And later in the video, you will see us presenting this like how we present in the real studio. And you have to kind of argue for that. It's like, look, I'm going to pitch this, this uh, classical turn-based RPG game that uses Dune. And let's go for, instead of a Diablo 3 kind of slightly cartoony look, let's, let's try for this photo real, photo texture look and see where it goes. 
maybe they'll get sold. Maybe the maybe the producer will go for that, and uh, we'll do a couple of three D tests and see what that looks like. If it doesn't look good, okay, fine, we tried. Um, if it does, hey, that could become the uh, that could become a next cool game that that you know try this look. So and that's our job. That's our job as a concept artist because this kind of stuff doesn't take long to do. It only takes about a week to generate uh, these paintings. Actually, these three are all done in a single day. So imagine on a real project in which we're given about a week to do, we could generate about uh, there's what three times five, fifteen of these per concept artist. So if you bring in say four or five concept guys in the early phase of a design, you could generate a whole entire wall for concept art by Friday. And that's I've seen that happen over and over in game studios, uh, even on films as well. For example, on Transformers, I think they had about four guys in the beginning, and within a week we generated enough drawings to fill the entire wall. So. And it's just cheap because everyone explores different uh, methods. For example, in this case, I kept it pretty realistically in which Ed and I actually did not talk to each other about what we're going to draw and what we're going to paint during this entire time. And that's very much like that in the real world because they want to make sure that the ideas from different concept artists are coming in differently versus like, hey guys, all five of you, every five of you guys will do this epic landscape or, or let's do a top down three quarter view. Because it kind of limits the imagination. What you want to do in the early phase of a concept pitch is to let the concept guys go off on their own. You know, the IP is there. We have Dune in this case, Desert Planet, Spices, um, different factions, different houses fighting each other. Okay, that's the basis. Now, what do you guys do? You know, with all your background and all your history and your design visual library, put that together for us without us telling you exactly what to draw. That opens up a lot of possibilities for the different solutions different concept artists bring into the uh, project. So in this case, it was quite interesting because um, by Friday, then that, that's how actually I saw Ed's stuff for the first time. I go, whoa, that's awesome with the big worms and stuff. Uh, whereas I stayed away completely from the epic scale stuff and retained like almost a small scale thing. And I think that's kind of fun. And then when he saw it as well, I was like, whoa, that's cool. It's very different. Um, yeah, in the real world, it works pretty much exactly the same way. Uh, at least in the situations I have been in. All right, let's go talk about a little bit about the technical aspect of this video. Um, these were done obviously in Photoshop, a CS5, and they're about 5,000 pixels wide. Uh, these images are not, not super big, but I think 5,000 pixels is plenty to do these rough concepts in. Um, started with the line drawing with the grid and then laid in photo textures as you saw earlier to get the initial color palette going. And then right now I'm just kind of uh, start to paint up the images uh, while the line drawing is still turned on. Right. You can see the navigator window on the bottom left corner. That's to kind of help me judge the overall lighting as I put in the uh, the major details. So this process at this point is getting pretty fun. Actually, once you have the line drawing, at least for me, once I have a design that I'm kind of happy with, the entire process becomes quite fun. It's very stressful in the beginning of a project where you have no idea what you're gonna do, right? Imagine this is like a real project and you have something delivered by Friday, like 15 Doom pitches or something. Um, it's very stressful. So if you get the drawing down, you kind of know an idea what you're gonna do for the rest of the week, it removes a lot of that kind of pressure. So now Doom is a cool book and I also try to stay away from the David Lynch movie version, which is quite cool, uh, very unique in terms of its design. But if this was an independently produced game, we have to actually stay away from the film IP, unless this IP was based on the film. Then in that case, I would not be designing these. I'll be basing it on the movie. Um, but I'm kind of imagining this as an independently uh, sourced license, which happens all the time. You could actually go to the estate of Dune and buy it just for the uh, production of an RPG game, for example, and they will release the rights just to, to make that uh, versus the film be, will be holding a different part of the license. So, and in that case, you actually have to design completely different from the movie uh, version. So I've actually had that happen on a project called Lord of the Rings in which I worked on the RTS version for EA. I think it's called Battle for Middle Earth, if I'm not mistaken. And in that case, EA licensed the um, non game movie version, I think, or was it the other way around? No, I think we licensed the movie side. That, that's right, that's right. EA actually licensed the movie rights to make the game. So in that case, I couldn't actually design too far off from what Weta uh, has done or Peter Jackson has done uh, with the film. So like if you had a work, we had to base it off the Alan Lee version of the work versus me coming in and doing a completely different version. So in this case, I'm kind of doing the opposite. I'm trying to stay away from David Lynch's version of Doom and coming up with my own. So these projects are fun to do. If you're a student out there, you can give yourself the spec as well. So just pick an IP, uh, pick something very old, hopefully, something classical, like don't redesign something that's very recent, for example, like Iron Man or something. You know what I'm saying? That's too recent, it's too much in the, in the news, it's too seen right now. 
So pick something that's classic, even if you're old games like Bomberman or something, you know, something that just goes back to the 90s or 80s or something. And then say, okay, well, let's reboot this IP at, into a game or into a film and give your best shot. What would you do with it without copying what came along, but still hopefully capturing the essence of the IP itself? So it's a great fun because it, it gives you a backstory to work with. It gives you a very good structure. Like something like Dune is extremely well structured. So great, great characters, great story, great landscapes. And you just paint away, let your imagination take, o- uh, take over. So now I'm painting the, this set. So both of these are kind of down angle views. Uh, I'm trying to create a lot of zigzagging in the space. So what I love about the original Baldur's Gate was that kind of effect that you could go left, right, up, down, everywhere you go. You have no idea what you're gonna explore into uh, because they had this kind of fog of war thing going on where you couldn't see the screen unless you walked there. So every step, you have no idea what you're about to bump into. And I loved about the game. Whereas like open world games, in a way, you cannot do Fog of War. You know, imagine playing Skyrim and there's a giant fog in front of you the whole time. And you can't see what you're getting into. That, that kind of made the game stupid. Versus, I mean, so that means you start the game, you can already see everything. You know, you can see the castle in the distance. And that has its own advantages, of course. Um, but in a way, it also changes the gameplay a little bit, right? Again, different type of game. So for Baldur's game, you're always on, on nerve because you have no idea, you know, you're about to die, you don't have enough potions, and then boom, you run into a big gang of uh, robbers or something uh, simply because the game revealed it. So I was trying to do that with these designs as well, in which you could go, kind of go down that alleyway right there, down to the glowing area, or maybe there's some spice left. You could go inside the machine, kind of to the left there, there's some holes you could walk into, or maybe you could go down and around to the back of the right. There's a kind of like an alleyway down there uh, with the fog. So all these things I'm trying to design to make this world heavily exploration based because with these type of games you cannot build a huge huge world i mean ideally we can make the world big but instead we spend the time and money building very very detail oriented and highly i guess specked out areas so for this part alone you, may, you might fight cool enemies maybe come back at nighttime and you can find different treasures by looking around a lot of details maybe things are animate over time a lot of stuff you could do so you invest on a smaller scale uh, versus building a huge huge world so while I was drawing this, I actually thought about some good, cool uh, gameplay things because the planet Arrakis is quite, it's hot, right? It's a desert planet. So maybe we could play around with sunlight and shadow as well. So maybe your suit has a certain kind of water retention. And if you stay out in the sun for too long, um, you could potentially die. So you might have to walk in shadows to cool off or perhaps wait for nighttime before you could go on a mission. And for gameplay, that's pretty cool because you can actually limit players for where they could go. Uh, according to the sunlight and shadow, so and those are things you kind of come up with, and we could pitch that in a in a production pitch. We could commission gameplay, but in most cases, we generally don't touch that stuff too much. We leave leave that to the experts, you know, the the guys who actually design games for a living. So our job is visual, but we do have ideas. Sometimes I have pitched gameplay ideas to the developers, and sometimes they get in. Sometimes like, nah, we can't do that because we don't have the technology. But as long as you're not, not annoying them or stepping on anyone's toes, uh, you could try, you know, but you definitely don't want it to be the opposite where you have a very simple drawing and it's like, ah, but this game has this, it has real time this, you could fight big giant monsters, but then it doesn't even show in your visuals. In that case, your words are way too high, right? In this business, visuals works for us. So you had to sell it at least in the, in the drawings. Okay. This piece was quite fun. I really like the colors. Uh, a lot of it gotten from the photo reference. I think this, this red stuff is actually some kind of algae. Uh, that's on growing on these rocks. I'm not sure, but the color is just beautiful. And I think you match that to a desert planet just to bring some color because since it's desert, I kind of want to stay away from green stuff, any, anything that has a high water retention, such as plants. And when you remove it, you're like, man, this world could be kind of boring. You know, you walk around, just rocks, cliff, rocks, cliffs all the time. So how could we dress that up a bit? So one is I played around with elevation having these kind of old mines, everything's kind of raggedy going up and down in space, so you're not walking on the flat plane. And two is like, what what other colors can we introduce? So when I saw these rock references, I thought, that's great, that's beautiful. This splash of red could bring a nice color palette to the to the eyes when you walk around. So, and of course the heavy use of shadows, because again, we're losing horizon, and with horizon loss, you never get the sense of epic scale. So we could do that, for example, by having huge shadows going across the landscape, having clouds roll across you, these are all things that hopefully technically they could achieve. Uh, and if this is being developed for next gen, these are definitely things we could do. And again, without the horizon, we could really pump up the poly count uh, within the localized areas. So I hope this kind of game actually comes back. It's really, really, it was really fun drawing these. Uh, it kind of brought back memories of uh, 1995 or something, playing those kind of classic games. 
And those games last forever. These are games that last like 200 hours or something ridiculous. You know, nowadays you look at a lot of games, they, they play for about five hours, six hours, and, and it's over. You know, you, even you get invested into it, it's like suddenly it's over. It's like five hours later, it's like, oh man, that's it. You know, those games you can really invest time into because a 200 hour game, man, you know your character is really, really well at that point and the story really, really well. So I hope those games make a comeback. I know Dragon Age 3 is in development. I hope they go back to the way Origins was as well. So I thought that was a great move by Bioware to kind of target the, uh, the hardcore game players but uh, anyways um so this episode is starting to come to an end right now i'm showing you guys the end result so i uh, hope you guys enjoyed what eduardo and i did on this project this is kind of like a sneak preview of what happens in the industry it's a great fun thing for you guys to try right pick an ip and just just do it yourself maybe you and your friend could both do it you know pick pick a couple of buddies together and go hey let's independently reboot a classic book or something you know like 1984 or something and just see what you get it's a great challenge for designers um, and it kind of gives you an IP to work off of. So, so yeah, so here I'm just kind of showing you the, uh, the various image big. And of course you go to my blog, which is, um, fengzudesign.blogspot.com and all these images will be there in high resolutions. Or look for me on Facebook or look for Ed on Facebook. Um, we're both there and these images should be there as well. So yeah, so I hope you guys enjoyed this episode and hopefully we'll produce another one soon. Maybe I'll do another one with Ed as well. Um, until then, leave your questions on the Facebook. Oh, by the way, our community website should be up soon, probably within a month. So crossing our fingers here that that new site will be up and it should be really, really cool when we launch it. So, okay, guys, thanks a lot. And I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye. All right, so Dune. Dune is a classic book written by Frank Herbert in 1965. And the reason why... I decided to choose to do this IP is because it's very popular among concept artists and it's of course being uh, envisioned by David Lynch in an excellent film called Dune, which I have here in my hands uh, right here. So why did I choose it? Because I think it's a fantastic world that's full of culture, it's full of references to technology, but yet at the same time it's not a high tech world. So you almost get this backwards movement in technology and that creates a nice challenge for concept artists. So we're not dealing with this super high slick tech uh, instead, you have a world that does not have robots, which is banned. You have a world in which artificial intelligence is banned. And it operates almost like ancient times in which you have different kingdoms fighting for control of a resource, which in this case is a, a spice. So I thought that would be a fantastic thing to convert into a video game. Um, I think a game version of Dune has been done for a long time. There was an RTS done in the mid-90s, I believe. And it hasn't been tackled since. So perhaps this will... Uh, create some inspiration for some of you guys out there who maybe want to one day turn this into a game yourself. So, all right, so that's why we chose this fantastic book. And if you haven't read it, go check it out. Frank Herbert, 1965, Dune. All right.